Good to see everyone. We're going to pick up in Deuteronomy 8, cover just one or two brief things there, and then we'll jump on in to 9 through 11, Deuteronomy 8, and then 9 through 11. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Uh, let's jump in here. Let's just go to question number 6 on the question sheet. Um, in the reading there, and particularly verses 5 through 10, uh, he had talked about how the Lord had chastened them. There were times when the Lord had chastened them. And the question relates to where else is the chastening of the Lord taught and what application is there for us? Does anybody have a reference on the chastening of the Lord? <laughs> Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, let's read verses 5 through 8. He had chastened the Israelites, chastened them in the wilderness, and in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, let's read these here. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. Who will grab that for us? Hebrews, I'm sorry. Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. Yes, sir. And you have forsaken exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who correct us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live. For they indeed, for they indeed for a few days chasten us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Okay, so we understand as he says here, the Lord chastens those he loves. He scourges every son whom he receives. So what lesson are we to take from that? How is that supposed to shape our view on life? Any thoughts? Clint? Uh, two sided, essentially. The one who gives the chase thing, you take it seriously. And it's not for abuse, but it's for correction. And it's for uh, the betterment of those who receive it. And so uh, you can't shirk that responsibility as a father, uh, personally. Uh, nor can you shirk the advice or the guidance or the discipline of your father as a son. Uh, you can't dismiss it. You can't uh, think that you know better than they. And so you need to accept it and know that it is for your purity. It's for your purity. It's to cut the fat. It's to cut away the things that aren't needed. You can't do things at all. Okay. And, and well, I was just going to say, in this particular passage, I think he's referring to the relationship of God to his people specifically and therefore um, it's, it's members of the church it's in, in, in Deuteronomy it's obviously the children of Israel but for us it's spiritual Israel and it's a relationship wherein because he loves us he chastens us and is for our good and so that kind of goes along with what Clint is saying in the family relationship uh, the earthly family. 
relationship. But if you're not chastened by the Lord, you're not His. Right, exactly. John? I think in the, in the context of these verses, when you see mention the, the health and the wealth that people have in those times, remember those things when they're good, but also in times turn difficult, remember those blessings that the Lord, Lord gave you. And you know, for us, no matter what we go through, there's a, a blessing that we have where God gave His only Son to die for us, and there, there is no more wonderful thing that we can ever fathom or imagine or go through that's going to be as bad as what happened to His only Son. So, you know, in those good times, remember the good times, and in the bad times, remember, you know, there's there's some, something much more special to us than any bad thing or good thing that we could ever have in this life. I think He's calling on those folks to remember those things, you know, no matter what they're going through. Mm -hmm. And the children of Israel... He, he talks about that He chastened them as they went through that wilderness. Uh, and it's a, maybe a little bit hard for us to appreciate exactly what they went through in that wilderness. They, they were in slavery in Egypt. There was oppression. There, there was suffering they were experiencing. I mean, their sons were being put to death. Um, but they lived in a, a land where later they look back and they say, remember the leeks, remember the onions, remember all that food we had? And they forgot about the oppression. But out in that desert, they didn't have that abundance and variety of food. And that's all they could focus on, it seems like, at times. And so the Lord gave them manna, the Lord gave them quail. And that's what they had to eat day in and day out as they were out there in the wilderness. And the Lord's describing it here in Deuteronomy 8 is remember that chastening. And I did it for your good. It was to help to create within them a desire to move forward into the land of Canaan. If He had taken them out and gave them a land of, or, or sent them through a land of milk and honey on their way to, to the promised land, they really wouldn't want to go. And they needed those bad attitudes, those bad habits. They, they needed things that would be purged out of them in the desert. And also at the same time creating a longing. We want to move forward into that land of Canaan. And the Hebrew writer, he's talking about this chastening of God. Don't despise that. You know, when we go through trials in life, do we despise those trials? Generally, I think we get upset about it. We, we don't like it. But we, we need to have more patience, more trust in God. This trial is actually good for me. It's actually helpful for me. This could very well be exactly God moving against me in my life, in His providence, to bring about some measure of pain and suffering so I focus on what I need to focus on. So I'm not so wrapped up in these things and I need to quit complaining and put my mind where it needs to be and move forward and do His bidding. Honor Him. Any other thoughts there? Clinton and Chris. Just one more. Is that this is it's a natural part of life. Especially if you're in the Hebrew letter. This is natural. It's, everybody has to go through that. And we completely despise it. I mean, we're like the fools to talk about the Proverbs. Who is, who is not accepting review, not accepting correction, and we're just going off in our own way. And we all know that man's way is not in himself. So we have to take that correction. Otherwise, we'll never amount to anything. Mm -hmm. Chris? For just as they weren't 40 years in the world, you see, your actions have your profession in the long run. You will have to take part of what's Right. And you think about this, these things that unfold in life. For, for the children of Israel, they're brought out of that land, they're brought miraculously by the mighty power of God into this desert and they start complaining. They're, they're being chastened out there in that wandering especially. They're being chastened in it. And they, they weren't looking at 
this, this is a means to an end. This, this is getting us to that promised land. This is God's plan. This is God's will in these things. Um, I'm reminded of Jacob and Joseph. When Joseph was taken away into slavery, his father, of course, was told or led to believe, your son is dead. Later, when Joseph talked to his brothers, he said, don't be angry with yourselves. It's not you. It's God who brought me here. Now, do you think Jacob, when he had that bloody coat in front of him, you know he wasn't thinking, well, God's hand is in all this. And he gets upset. He's very distraught. As we understand naturally a father would be, but it's one of those accounts that reminds me, you know what, no matter what happens, I need to be careful about how I react to it because it very well could be God's hand working here. And I don't know what's down the road. The Hebrew writer says, the reason He chastens us is to yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It's a hard thing to, to see that when we're going through the chasing, we're going through the trial, the difficult time. But we need to take this lesson of trusting God, accept life's adversity, press forward with faith in Him. In the end, God is working for our good, for our benefit, whatever that may be. He's working for the good. Our souls chiefly to be saved. Right, Zach? So another reason why... That is the in 1 Corinthians 11, 32. It says, But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned for the world. So the element of discipline that receiving such discipline helps us be disciples. This is the same word. It helps us be not the world, God's people that can be seen by the world. Uh, who would perhaps seek the discipline of the Lord and repent. That's what Jesus says in Revelation 3.19. Those who I love, I re rebuke. But as many as I love, I rebuke. So repent, he's zealous to repent. So all that's tied together and being a disciple, one who's been disciplined. Exactly. Exactly. This for our discipline. Alright, let's jump forward now to Deuteronomy chapter 9. Let's start digging into this. In Deuteronomy 9, let's read verses 1 through 6 here. Deuteronomy 9. Well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's read 1 through 3. Let's stick with that right now. Who will read 1 through 3? Paul? Hear, O Israel, you are... Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today. Go to... to... this... 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 nation greater and mightier than yourself. Cities great and fortified up to heaven. A people great and tall, the descendants of the Amatites, whom you know and of whom you heard it said, who are who can stand before the descendants of the Amatites. Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you, and as a consuming fire, he will destroy them, bring them down before you. So you shall drive them out and destroy them quick, as the Lord has said to you. Okay. All right. So in this section, the first part of chapter 9, Moses is establishing the basis for why, for their going in to the land of Canaan. Um, and what is it that he's talking about? There in verse 1, he says, you're, you're going in to do this. Dispossess the nations in the greater than Okay, what does it mean to dispossess the nations? Take, get rid of them. Take what they have. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going in there. You're, you're getting rid of them. You're taking over their territory. Why? Because they were wicked. It wasn't, as he goes on to talk about, it's not because you're so good. It's not because you're righteous. The New American Commentary says that 
what is insurmountable to humankind is of no consequence to God. He talks about, you know, you're going in, they're greater than you, they're mightier than you, the, the cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moses is telling them, you have a huge job to do when you go in here, but you're going to do it. Because God is with you. You know, Jericho, they go in, the very first one, you can imagine how how exciting, how thrilling that would have been to march around those walls six days, the seventh day, march around seven times, and you shout, and they just fall. But what, I mean, that would be just thrilling. And you run in, you take the city, and all of that. You know, so what seems like an impossible task for man, for God, it's nothing. That's what he wants to unfold. That's what's going to unfold. And he can do it. He can accomplish that. Um, so question number one, why would Israel be able to conquer Canaan? Maybe we just answered it. Sorry, I stepped all over the answer. I was just too low because they were with and got it. promised it to Abraham that that would be much more Okay. Vineyards are there. Right. And, you know, there are times, especially you get over into the latter days of Israel, the latter days of Judah, and God's basically telling them, I'm going to take a, a nation that's more wicked than you to punish you. So the Assyrians came in, and then of course the Babylonians came into the southern kingdom and eventually took them. And he was using them to rebuke his people, to teach them a lesson, and really to send that lesson to everyone who would hear of that, of what had happened. So he uses nations as instruments to punish other nations. And he's using Israel here as a nation, as his people, as Hank said, there's a twofold thing here. It's God's plan that He's going to give them the land, but He's also using them to punish the wickedness of the people in that land. So God is at work. There's a factor with God. There's a factor with the residents of the land being wicked. But there's a factor also of the Israelites being obedient to God and going in and doing the work. So all those things are combining together for them to go in and do it. And if we are going to accomplish God's will, there's a part that we have to do and there's a consequence then, of course, for ourselves and then for others as we do God's will. We, we get out, we uproot error. Well, sometimes people don't like that. And it's a hard job, but it's something that we must do. Any other thoughts there? What's that? Well, what I just noticed is the sense of urgency. Today, you're going to do this amazing thing through me, my you. That's kind of... I uh, wonder if that's part of the message, part of the tone. Moses is telling the people, God says, this is what we're doing today. So today, and he says that word twice, uh, once in verse 1, and again in verse 3. Uh, it's not, okay, three weeks from now, this is the plan. Here's exactly the, the logistics. Which was, because God doesn't need time to plan. He just needs us to be ready to obey immediately. Yeah, they, they need to accept it. They need to have this firmly fixed in their mind. This is God's will. You need to let that soak in. Clint. This is conditional too. You see, verse 3 says, The Lord your God is He who goes out before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy you and bring them down before you. So you shall drive them out. Condition. So they had to trust that God would do what He said. And so that's no different than what, us, what we have today. God has said, I'll prepare a place for you. But you have this to do while you're here on earth. And so that's, it's, a, it's a good correlation for us to learn that. 
everything is conditional with God based on obedience. Well, another way to put that is, it's yours for the taking. I've set everything up. You go in and do it. And we know, you know, especially the beginning of Joshua there, they go in, the spies go in, and Rahab tells them essentially, look, everybody is completely freaked out about you guys. Because we know what happened there at the Red Sea. We know you're right here at our doorstep. So God, in that sense, He had gone in and He had put the fear of God in the people of the land as Israel marched in and then started doing their work. But yeah, good thoughts. Any other thoughts there? Alright, now, jumping down verses 7 through the end of the chapter, Moses goes into this thing that he, he keeps coming back to again and again. He reminds them of their rebellion against God. And most of this is focused on what happened at Sinai. Now, remember these people he's speaking to, the, the older people were young. Um, you know, teens or earlier, mostly at, at this time, but there's, it's still in their living memory as to what had happened while they were at Mount Sinai and then of course what had happened over the then following 40 years in the desert with some other events that he brings up in this. But he's focusing a lot on the rebellion that was at Sinai with the making of that calf and his reaction, God's reaction, and everything that unfolded from that. But he reminds them that while he was up on the mountain, and receiving the covenant from God, they were down there worshiping this golden calf. So to, to me, it's that's an interesting dichotomy there between, you know, Moses is up there receiving the word of God, the command of God, this covenant that would bring these people into a unique relationship with God, and they're down there making this calf and throwing a wild party, worshiping this calf. And you can understand why God was so furious with them and wanted to destroy them and wipe them out because they've already heard those Ten Commandments and they said, we'll do whatever you say. Whatever you say, we will do it. And it wasn't just a short time later because they thought Moses had disappeared up on the mountain. Well, let's find someone else and let's go back to Egypt. Uh, you know, make us a calf, all those kinds of things. So. This, this was a major rebellion as it keeps being repeated and emphasized to them again and again. Now, there were other rebellions in verses 22 and following there that he brings up and he talks about, and we won't dig into those, but there's you know the rebellion of the bitter complaining, the rebellion where they lusted for food, and God said, okay, you want food, I'm going to give you quail. And I'm not just going to give you one day. I'm not going to give you two days. I'm going to give you so much you're going to eat it and it's going to come out of your nostrils. I mean, think about God saying that to them. He, he was, again, furious with their attitudes. He talks about the rebellion of the spies, you know, at Kadesh Barnea and how you, know, you wouldn't go on into the land. Uh, so one of the things he's doing... He, he kind of breaks up this discussion about the rebellion at Mount Horeb with the calf by saying, oh, by the way, you also did this and this and this. So it wasn't the only time. But this is a pattern. This is a habit with you. You've got this problem of turning against God, losing faith in God. So let's read verses 13 to 21 and just pull a piece of this out as Moses is rebuking the people. So Deuteronomy 9, verses 13 down through 21. Who will read that? Mike. Furthermore, the Lord said to me, the Lord spoke uh, further to me, saying, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stubborn people. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from heaven, and I will make of you a great nation, mightier and greater than that. So I turned and came down from the mountain while the mountain was burning with fire and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I saw that you had indeed sinned against the Lord your God. You had made for yourselves a molten calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way which the Lord had commanded you. I took hold of the two tablets and threw them from my hands and smashed them before your eyes. I fell down before the Lord as at first, forty days and nights. I neither ate bread 
nor drank water because of all your sin which you had committed in doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was wrathful against you in order to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me that time also. The Lord was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him. So I prayed for Aaron at the same time. I took your sinful thing, the calf which you made, and burned it with fire and crushed it, grinded it in very small until it was as fine as dust. And I threw its dust into the brook that came down from the mountain. Okay, and then in verse 25, after he mentions those others, he comes back and he says, Thus I prostrated myself before the Lord forty days and forty nights. I kept prostrating myself because the Lord had said He would destroy you. And so he's, he's trying to remind them and ingrain in them, look, God, when you rebelled against Him, when this nation rebelled against Him before, He was within a hair of killing all all of you and bringing up another nation from me. It was like right there. And without my fervent, consistent, persistent intercession for you, it would have happened. Forty days, forty nights, I was begging and pleading with God. When we read back in Exodus, I don't recall it specifically stating he spent forty days and forty nights begging for the children of Israel. It mentions a prayer that he offers up there. But the Lord had to or the, uh, Moses had to keep pleading with the Lord, don't do this, don't do this. And so he's reminding them of, this, of the Lord's wrath there on that mountain and that he is the same God who's over them now. Be careful that you don't fall into this trap again. Now one of the interesting things in verse 21 is he talks about what he did with the calf and what did he do with that calf. Okay, he ground it up into little pieces and what did he do? Made them drink it. Okay, one of the things I read is that, you know, their sin became their bodily waste. Now, this is one of those things in the Bible, it's, it's you read through it and maybe at first you don't quite connect it. You know, when Jezebel was killed, remember that she was thrown out of the windows, and the dogs came and ate her, and she became their waste out in the field. And that was prophesied. That's what God thinks of these sins. That's what God thinks about this rebellion. That's what God thinks of idolatry. It's bodily waste. And so, we, we need to get this understanding of, of God's view of these types of things and of the rebellion that was committed by the people. So question number two, I ask, how do we prevent quickly turning from the Lord or prevent ourselves from quickly turning from the Lord? As these people quickly turn from Him, how do we prevent that? Any thoughts? Never again, staying in the Word prayer, following His will, and keeping our eyes and our heart upon Him and His desires. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Normal prayer. Constant prayer. Pray for that season. Constant prayer. Remind what Jesus is the only single one. Okay. Then we have to keep, keep our minds in the right place. The problem with these people, they didn't keep their mind in the right place. They let their minds drift back to Egypt. Well, I mentioned before, unlike the denomination, we, we recognize our Savior. Uh, for a day of the week, that we do these in a matter of uh, as they are instructed us to do, uh, and we maintain that. Uh, it's so easy to fall away. It's so easy to forget. You said, well, no, I never forget. Well, okay, to your point, Paul, the, the regularly coming together on the first day of the week, reminding ourselves in the Lord's Supper of the sacrifice that was given for us, but the other acts of worship as well, 
As Zach mentioned a while ago, it's a discipline. We are disciplined in it regularly. Coming together regularly, praying regularly, reading the Word. That's all our mind. So, right, exactly. <coughs> My, when I was considering this question, the thing Israel stopped doing was cleaving to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, all the things we're talking about are an aspect of that, but you have to mentally know that you don't want to walk through this world without holding on to the Lord. Because that's a terrifying thing, but they forgot that all the time. So they stopped cleaving to the Lord, and every time they did, they went astray. Yes, and Clint, go ahead. Because something's going to fill that space. You know, the Lord talked about a man who, or the, this house that was possessed with an evil spirit, it, it swept and clean, he's gone, and he, and he comes back, finds it empty, he gets seven others and comes in. We, we have to be filled up so there's no room for Satan to come in after us. Zach? Zach, there are some two comments. They lost her touch with God, certainly. They lost touch with their leader, their earthly leader, Moses. Uh, they. They didn't give him the proper time to return, as you indicated earlier. They thought he was long gone, uh, so they didn't hold out for him. But I, I couldn't help but think of our spiritual leaders and the local congregation with the fellowship. You know, do we follow their? They, they've been given charge over shepherding us, and if we don't follow them, we too will look like we put something as a leader in their stead it's not up. And for them it was an idol that became their uh, leader of sorts. Right. He, even after he had proven himself through the plagues, leading them out to Mount Sinai, they they didn't have that respect and trust in him. Well also they they never let go of their past life. Right. They kept thinking about back to Egypt, back to Egypt. So anytime their faith was weak, then they'd go and say, well, we should go back to Egypt, or hey, let's make a calf like we had in Egypt. And that just led them into further sin. You know, and that's the same with us. We can't let past sins keep drawing us back and separating us from God. Right. As we easily forget the pain that was associated, they forgot all the slavery in Egypt, or ignored it, buried it in their mind. Then, Ron Jameson. Yes, Stephen, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, of course, talking about the very things that we are describing here now, he says in verse 5, but with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness, speaking that they are an example unto us. And then in verse 11, he says, now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Yeah. Uh, not only keep in mind God's love, God's goodness, God's um, word and guidance and all those things and coming together to worship, but remember that God was absolutely brutal and ruthless with these people who rebelled against Him. John, do you have something in mind? Well, when you read this, you wonder... These people aren't worthy to go into the promised land because all, all of these sins that Moses outlined. But the simple fact is, as Hank pointed out, God keeps His promise. And that, you know, that's the theme of, a, of the book. God keeps His promise. And that's what Moses is trying to tell these people. If you will stay faithful, God is going to keep His promise to you. And Ezekiel promised that there's going to come a time when someone's going to come along and take them. Away, away the sin of all mankind, not because of anything we do, but because God keeps His promises. And that's what Moses is trying to tell these people. God's going to keep His promise, but what that shows is God's love. He wants us to be faithful. 
faithful, and he will keep his promise no matter what. It will stay faithful. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I kind of got the same thing that you know they were continually going back to their lives. So, you know, that's why they continue to trip. And it just kind of brought to mind where uh, Paul says in Philippians chapter uh, 3, I do not regard myself as having a whole dog yet, but I press forward. I look forward, not regarding anything that's behind me. It's all rubbish back there. And, you know, I do think he's talking about, first of all, his sins and also his accomplishments as well. That needs to be left behind also. And just because I've had accomplishment, I, that doesn't carry me into the future. I have experience from it, but I continue to press forward. And, uh, you know, that's something I think that they were missing out is that they were not pressing forward. Right, right, exactly. I've, I've heard members of the church say, talk about the good old days, and when they're talking about that, they're talking about when they were young and they're used to doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. Right. And I was like, well, I, I didn't have those good old days. Those weren't the good days for me. Right. We, we should never describe our time of life in sin, committing sin, as, oh, you know, that was just you know, kind of fun, and I kind of miss the, those days. We have to describe them for what they are. They're an abomination in the sight of God. We, we shouldn't want any part of it anymore. Um, question number three I'd ask, what would have been said had Israel been destroyed by God? And this is part of Moses' reasoning with God. If he had destroyed them, what does Moses say? This is what's going to be said. Well, the other nations are going to look around and go, what kind of God is that? That you bring them out there just to destroy them. Right. And that was the exact argument they were using also. He brought us out here to destroy us. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't keep, like John mentioned earlier, he doesn't keep his promises. God didn't keep his promises. He hates us. He, he killed us. Right. The answer is specifically in verse 28 of this. And it says, Bless the land from which you brought us, you should say, because the Lord was not able to bring them to the land which He promised them, and because He hated them, He has brought them out to kill them in the wilderness. Okay. He lacks power, and He actually hated them. He didn't love them. And His whole thing in this was, I love you, and I'm going to bring you into this land. I love your fathers. I made a promise to them. I'm going to stay committed to that. Um, now, here's the funny thing about it. Premillennialism says God did not keep His promise. Yes. Exactly the opposite of what Moses is making the argument on here. So, anybody who believes that doctrine believes that God failed to do what He said He was going to do. That's the problem with premillennialism. It is blasphemy against God. And we can't paint over that. We can't act like it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. It completely undermines faith in God. Nancy. Well, it's always interested me in these different occasions when Moses said these kinds of things to God. He's stating the obvious. Now, God already knows what people would say. But it kind of helps me because when I'm praying about things sometimes, I know I'm stating the obvious to God. <laughs> and... Um, and so I just say that. I know I'm stating the obvious to you. But Moses did that. But 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 he's telling he's telling uh, God that he's really trying to figure out how to deal with this. Yeah. And the this plea was an exercise of faith on Moses' part that God was listening, that God did care, that God could be persuaded to change his mind in these things. And we need to know, you know, God is listening and he does care. And we can persuade him. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We can do that. So no matter how the situation may look, we can plead with God, but we always need to be ready to accept whatever the outcome is, whatever that may be. And as Nancy said, God knows it, but we need to express that to him. Uh, for the sake of time, I need to run on here. One of the things I just want to point out is Israel's experience and actions at Sinai lays bare the lie that if God were here, we would do things differently. You know, sometimes people think, well, 
you know, if we live back in New Testament times and we saw Jesus or saw the apostles and saw these miracles, it would be different. Well, no, it wouldn't be different. I mean, these people heard God speak from the mountain. And just a few days later, they're making this calf. It's no different. It, it has to do with our hearts. Now, in chapter 10, Deuteronomy 10, let's read verses 1 through 5, please. Who will grab that for us? Deuteronomy 10, 1 through 5. I want you. Now at that time, the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two talents of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up to the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing. The Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Then I turned and I came down from the mountain, put the tablets in the ark which I had made. And there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. Okay. Now, I just, I want to key in on this. You, you had the covenant that they made when God originally spoke the Ten Commandments. They said, we will do that. Moses goes up on the mountain. He receives the tablets of stone, but they rebel. He comes down. Remember, he threw them and broke them. And that was really a sign of the covenant has been broken. You've destroyed it. Now he goes back up onto the mountain and write on the tablets, verse 2, what? What was he to write on the tablets? Any lesson there? God said something that's the way it stays. His will was unchanged. Their rebellion did not move God off of this is my law. Our rebellion doesn't change God's law. Our determination, hard headedness, or as he describes them, our being stiff-necked does not change God's law. There's no negotiating with God on the law. Now, there was negotiating with God on the punishment of the children of Israel and what would happen with that, but He wasn't going to negotiate out the Ten Commandments. Well, we like these three and these four. Let's modify here and these two. Let's just chunk them. That, that was never going to happen. But, I like to miss the Deuteronomy 4 two. Add to it can't take away from this. You have to do what I command. And this was just a re-utterance of that command. Essentially, yes, Mike. Well, also, the law wasn't for God. The law was for them. Right. And it was the best for them. And they didn't see that. Right. They think that, you know, I'm going to follow the law, but God needs me to follow the law. No, God needs to follow the law so that you understand that you need to go out of your life. Right. This, this is a blessing for you. God's law is always... A blessing for people. Now, moving forward, and question number four I had asked. Now, in in from chapter 10, verse 12, down through chapter 11, what Moses is doing is establishing their motivation to serve God. And he, he goes through these things. You read through this section, and you think, well, he's just saying the same thing again. And he's saying it again, and he's saying it again. But actually, he's giving different reasons about their motivation in these things. Um, he begins by telling them they're obligated to serve God. And we're just going to skip question four for right now. In verses 14 to 16, let's read those just to grab one of these arguments that he's laying out. So Deuteronomy 10, 14 through 16. Who will grab that for us? John. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heavens of heaven and the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set His heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples, as you are this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. Okay. So he talks about heaven, the highest heavens belong to God or the Lord your God. 
also the earth and all that is in it. He's describing Almighty God. How big God is and what belongs to God. So there's a motivation because He is the Almighty God. Verses 17 and 18, He talks about essentially that you have a perfect God. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widows and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. So here is a perfect God, mighty and awesome. So He's Almighty God. He's a perfect God. Um, it talks about in verse 22 that He's made you a great nation. So that should motivate you in going forward. In chapter 11, 1 through 7, He talks about serve God because you'll be blessed if you do and cursed if you don't. And so He's going through this reasoning. Here's why you need to do it. So when we read this, don't think He's just mindlessly repeating things. He's laying out different arguments. And when we look at our motivation to serve God, we should see multiple reasons why we serve Him. He sent His Son. He spared our lives. He's given us all that we have. He's blessed us with family. Uh, he's given us this reward of heaven. Uh, he talks about that there is a hell and we want to avoid that. So we can list out all kinds of reasons to motivate us to serve God. In fact, really every rational reason compels us and pushes us toward serving God. Any thoughts on those things? Right, question number five I'd ask, describe Israel's mindset before and after crossing the Red Sea. What was their mindset before when they're up against that Red Sea? They were fearful. Fearful. What was it when they got to the other side? Right after, right after, right after they got there. Okay, they, they were fearful on the one side and cheerful on the other. They rejoiced. Remember the song of Moses, right? So they had that, and he's reminding them of that. Don't you see where God is leading you? Going into that promised land is going to be a challenge, but, but there's a reward. There's a blessing in it. You'll just hang in there, have faith in God, and do what you need to do. Then it's all going to be okay. Alright. Any other thoughts? Really down through chapter 11. We have one more question, but... Clint, go ahead. Just real quick, as far as... You know, Moses left them. He was on the mountain, but they reacted badly because they were fearful that they lost Moses. They were fearful because they were up against the sea. And God led them through that. God gave them the covenant. And, you know, ten... They were fearful of starving in the desert. Right. Okay. It's, it's this pattern of fear. And what this, like, just what you said earlier, you replace that fear of whatever with 10 verse 20. You shall fear the Lord, your God. You shall serve Him. You have to replace any fear with God. And right. do what's right. 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 It will... You know, John describes, you know, perfect love casts out fear. Some people think that means perfect love casts out fear of God. No, the Bible repeatedly says fear God, fear God, fear God. It, perfect love should cast out the fear of those things in the world that are around us and these, these challenges. And God doesn't expect us to say, you know what, I'm happy that I lost my job. You know, that's not the view. It's saying you don't fall apart when you lose your job. You don't turn to the world in worldly ways because you lost your job. You don't lose your faith. Or you, your faith should grow stronger in those times of stress and difficulty and challenges instead of weaker. All right? Why? Because we can look back, we can see in our own lives as well as the lives of the people in the Bible how that God was with them through these things. And if we're faithful to Him, He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. Alright, any other thoughts? Alright, thank you all, Lord Will. We'll pick up next lesson, press and forward next week.